Beckett. I mean, this whole mess started with the Woodrow Wilsons of the time and the creation of this artificial country and uh, so our involvement in, in Iran in, in 1953. So, um, it, it, yes, it's very important that we deal with it, uh, with, with Russia, but uh, it also means that we have to deal with this as policy, get people to be convinced that non-intervention is patriotic and it's good for our country. Then they take that principle and they apply it then we'd all be much better off. Uh, <clears throat> sir, uh, I'm John Utley with the American Conservative Magazine. Uh, health care, the high cost of health care, health care for the uninsured, is one of the, the third most important issue in this election. And yet the Republican Party isn't doing much, if you will, or promoting what could be. Uh, I refer, for example, there's a new system, the Minute Clinics, or Walmart has a similar uh, clinic, and medicines for four dollars, generic medicine, that there's a system where poorer people could get care, uh, the Medicaid system, which costs probably hundreds of dollars per visit to the taxpayers, could be done. These, co these cost $59 per visit. Isn't there, can you comment on that type of system that's growing and how that could be encouraged perhaps to get a control on health care and allow health care for poor people particularly children, where it's often very common diseases can be taken care of in a situation like that. Well, we have to, in medicine, like everything else, we should legalize freedom of choice and get the government out of the way. The government's been managing medical care since the early 1970s, and they've mismanaged it, and they pushed the prices very high, and they've limited limited options. Uh, the licensing process is, uh, is another thing. You know, in some of these type of... Uh, uh, opportunities that you talk about if uh, if we didn't uh, have a government monopoly and and protect all the doctors and and their and, and their licenses and prevent people from doing certain things but today it's going in the other direction the drug companies want to take over control of all alternative medicines and and uh, nutritional products and the WTO wants to come in but yes if the market were left to work a lot of that would happen but we really need to change the ERISA laws and the tax laws and make if any tax advantages go to the individuals not to large corporations, and uh, you can't deal with um, with this without dealing with a monetary issue. Because you even said it in your question that it costs too much, and it is true. Uh, markets can adapt to the rising costs due to inflation to some degree, sort of like it does adapt for computers and, and calculators and, and, you know, cell phones. Those prices don't go up nearly as much as medicine because the government's involved in medicine. So you really can't deal with the cost unless you understand the monetary issue, which means we have to quit printing the money. You have to address the subject of uh, the Federal Reserve System so you don't have inflation. When I started in medicine in the, in the early 1960s, I was doing some moonlighting in San Antonio, I was in the Air Force, and uh, I'd work for three dollars an hour, stay up for twelve hours a night, see emergency patients because I wanted the experience and I wanted the three dollars. That was when three dollars bought a little bit more than they buy it buys today. But there was no there was no Medicare, no Medicaid, and nobody was turned away, and uh, everybody got their care. It was run by a church. Uh, but this doesn't happen anymore. Today, if it's a church hospital, the costs are going up and they can't keep up with it. So if you happen to walk in there, they put you on Medicaid so they can get reimbursed. It's that whole mentality of letting the government manage it has to be attacked. The most important thing to deal with that, of course, was to have the medical savings account, get the control of the initial cost in the hands of the patient so that they can go and have as much, much choice as, uh, as possible and then have major medical policies. Uh, today, we, insurance really isn't insurance. They're not measuring risk. They're just uh, it's sort, of, sort of prepaid care. And if somebody can't afford it, then they get it from the government, and then it becomes a welfare thing. So it, it is a real mess, and unfortunately, there's little understanding, and that's why uh, uh, Obama and Hillary are capitalizing on this, and they really uh, will most likely make the problem much, much worse. Yes, uh, Dr. Paul, I'm Dane von Breikenrockart with the U.S. Bill of Rights Foundation. Uh, you know, the good faith and credit of the United States has always sustained us quite well. We, we did very well with it, but it seems like it's getting cracks in the very people that we depend upon to invest in our country. 
we're beginning to see them to pull back and sell off their bills and you know they don't trust it they sort of see the good faith and credit as a printing press and in ink and paper from the United States and that there's really nothing backing it or very little backing it and I can remember as far back as the 70s when I first got interested in monetary policy is that there were these writers, they, they, almost every year there was the book, you know, the, the coming collapse of 1970, then the coming collapse of the 1980s and the 90s, and we still have it today. My question of you is, if we really do have an economic crash, an absolute crash, the, the worst thing that you can imagine, what will it look like and how will we know that it's here because a lot of people say we're already in that crisis we're just in de denial yeah so, so yes anyway yeah so anyway what will it look like and 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 how will it affect us in an everyday life after the collapse you know um, to understand this I think you have to understand a little bit about the subjective theory of value because there is a subjective element into the value of currency like the value of anything else uh, you can't take the calculation say the uh, Fed uh, created $20 trillion in so many years and therefore all the prices should go up. It's, it doesn't work that way. I mean, in the I remember the breakdown at Bretton Woods. That was a big event for me and prompted me to get interested in politics. And, uh, and, and it did lead to a lot of adjustments in, in the 1970s. But we, we didn't have it full faith and credit. We, we failed it. We promised it, at least to, not to American citizens anymore, but we promised all foreigners if you brought your dollars there, we'd give them, at $35, we'd give them an ounce of gold. And then we ran out of gold, so we had to quit. So we declared, in essence, that we were bankrupt when it comes to currency. So the amazing thing is, is although there was rough adjustments in the 70s, all of a sudden the world decided, well, we'll trust the dollar as if it is gold. And uh, that only taught us to uh, develop our greatest export, dollars. And it taught us not to save. We didn't have to save. And if we could uh, just print money and spend it overseas, maybe our jobs would end up leaving. And they did uh, because we got a free ride on it. And as you described, they're losing confidence. But what you don't know is when they lose total confidence, the currencies can be destroyed gradually over many, many years. But in the third world nations, uh, which we have a pretty good, um, a lot more history of, they go down, they go down in value, then all of a sudden, boom, you know, they go off the cliff. And the question you're asking, will it go off the cliff or will they rescue it? In, the 19, in 1979, it almost went off the cliff. You know, uh, 800 and some dollar gold back then was, you know, like $2,500 today. So there was a lot of panic there. But they restored confidence and they do a lot of maneuvering and manipulating uh, with the central banks. And they're doing that now. I'm, I think they're frantic on what they're doing. And I think they're, um, you know, they're still, there's some dumping dollars overseas, but there's still a lot of buying too. And there's still some accumulation. but. Who's doing it? But I think it's a collusion with the central bankers. So uh, someday they're going. We're going to wake up, and it'll. I think the market's stronger than the central bankers and the governments. So eventually they will reject it. I think if if tomorrow we wake up and Bush decides to do what some people suspect he might do, and goes and hits hits Iran, I mean that might be a precipitating event because we have undermined the foundation. Uh, we don't say there's no soundness to our currency. We don't have uh, great industrial production anymore. And that might send the signal, you know, that, wow, what are we doing now? And uh, oil could go to $200 in a week or a night if, if he does that. And some people argue that uh, and there's no way, and I argue that too, no way, they're not that crazy. They couldn't possibly do that. But others who have more experience in foreign affairs than I do say, don't put it past them, they might. If they did that, uh, I think it would be catastrophic. The dollar would crash, interest rates would skyrocket, and the one good thing is the empire would end. We would come home. I think the empire will end. Uh, because of, of the inability for us to finance it this way. They will not live off, uh, we, we won't, the Chinese and others will not allow us to live off them and that's what we're doing. We keep buying our stuff by, by printing money and uh, it, whether it's total overnight or steadily, we will have to cut back. And, uh, and